Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in to my presentation for the 25th anniversary celebration of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. My name is Joshua Lively and I am the Curator of Paleontology at the USU Eastern Prehistoric Museum right here in Price, Utah. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my research over the last decade or so on uh, turtles from the Kaparowitz formation of the monument and in particular a brand new fossil that was discovered here in the monument just over the past few years by monument paleontologist Dr. Alan Titus. Now Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, you're likely very familiar with it since you are tuning in to this presentation and hopefully all of the other presentations uh, for this celebration. But we're going to be focused on a portion of the monument right out in the middle uh, known as the Kaparowitz Formation, which is in dark green on this, uh, uh, on this map. And Kaparowitz Formation is all of these beautiful gray to orange badlands representing floodplains and rivers very similar to the Mississippi River and its tributaries and surrounding floodplains um, that were crisscrossing southern Utah between 76 and 74 million years ago. So even though it's a very dry environment today, it looked very different back during the Cretaceous. Uh, maybe even uh, something that was seasonally wet and dry, similar to the Amazon uh, River Basin of today. And of course, the Kaparowitz Formation is well known for its abundance of dinosaurs. Uh, quite a few new species of dinosaurs uh, have been discovered in the Kaparowitz Formation uh, over the last couple of decades, and you'll hear about those in other presentations. But the Kaparowitz Formation preserves an entire ecosystem uh, that includes birds, crocodilians, uh, clams, all sorts of other uh, organisms. And the focus of my talk today uh, will be on the turtles. It turns out freshwater turtles are some of the most common fossils that you find in the Kaparowitz Formation alongside all of the dinosaur fossils. I would uh, estimate for every dinosaur we find, we find at least 10 turtle, spe uh, turtle uh, fossils in uh, the Kaparowitz Formation out in the monument. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the different turtles that are known from the monument. Uh, you will uh, hear about uh, turtles that have been worked on by other researchers, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about my own research and uh, the research of some of my collaborators. So just starting off going through some of the common turtle groups known from the monument, uh, some of these are going to be very familiar to you uh, because representatives of those groups are still around today. Uh, the chelidroids, the snapping turtles, are uh, known from the monument. Their shells are very small and thin. Uh, these aren't the big alligator snapping turtles of today, uh, but we do find uh, uh, fragments of snapping turtle shells in the Kaparowitz today. Uh, you also find mud turtles. Uh, you may uh, know the kinosternids today as mud turtles or stink pot turtles. Uh, we do find early representatives of them in the Kaparowitz formation as well. And again, their shells are quite thin and uh, can be very fragile, so we don't find them quite as often as some of the larger turtles in the Kaparowitz formation, um, but they are out there, and at least uh, one species has been named by Tyler Leeson and colleagues from the Denver Museum. Softshell turtles are some of the most abundant turtle fossils that are found in the monument. We have them, of course, today in uh, modern uh, river systems uh, really all around the world. Uh, and uh, we know of at least four different species from the Kaparowitz Formation. Um, some of these are more common than others, uh, and uh, there are at least two species uh, that have not been named yet uh, from the Kaparowitz Formation. 
Now, those are the different groups of turtles, your snapping turtles, mud turtles, soft shell turtles that are gonna look familiar to you. You've seen them in modern river systems if you live in areas uh, where turtles are abundant, particularly in the southeastern United States. Uh, but there are also representatives of extinct groups of turtles as well, known from the Kaparowitz Formation. Some of these are quite large. Uh, one of these is a turtle called a docus. We have uh, a few shells of this turtle. Uh, uh, these turtles can get well over two feet in length, um, some, some of them even closer to three feet in length. Uh, here's an example of myself and uh, Tyler Berthesell from the uh, Natural History Museum of Utah collecting one of these when I was a graduate student at the University of Texas. Uh, this was about a 200 pound jacket that we have strapped down to this uh, backboard carrying it out of the Kaparowitz Formation. But Adokus isn't the large turtle that we find in the Kaparowitz. Uh, that may belong to the turtle Basilemmes. Um, over the last few years in particular, the Denver Museum of Na Nature and Science has collected a number uh, of beautifully preserved Basilemmes uh, skeletons. Uh, some of them including uh, eggs uh, inside of the turtles, showing that they were pregnant females, uh, but also preserving uh, portions of the limbs, indicating that they had uh, bones in the skin uh, covering their limbs, very similar to modern day tortoises. And in fact, Basilemmes probably represented a turtle ecology very similar to modern day tortoises, uh, mostly living on land. Whereas most of the other turtles you'll hear about today are living in uh, the river systems, ponds on the floodplain, that kind of thing. Mostly, uh, most of the turtles preserved in the Kaparowitz ecosystem uh, appear to be aquatic or semi-aquatic. Now, the focus of my master's project at the University of Utah uh, nearly a decade ago, was on a group of turtles known as the Bayenids. Uh, Bayenid turtles were freshwater turtles, just like all the others preserved in the uh, Kaparowitz Formation, uh, known from about 120 million years ago up to about 40 million years ago, uh, known from the Cretaceous through the Eocene. So they, uh, the group actually survives the extinction that knocks out all the non-avian, non-bird dinosaurs. Uh, and uh, I was really interested in studying these because they are the most abundant and diverse uh, group of turtles in the late Cretaceous. So you can really learn a lot about the aquatic ecosystems, these freshwater ecosystems, by studying Bayenid turtles. Uh, also, they were mainly restricted to Western North America, a landmass known as Laramidia, isolated from Eastern North America by a Western interior seaway. So if you really want to get a handle on studying the ecosystem of uh, Western North America during the late Cretaceous, this is actually a very uh, good group of turtles to study uh, because uh, places like the Kaparowitz Formation are just absolutely dirty with bayonet uh, fossils. Uh, tons and tons of turtles have come out of uh, uh, the Kaparowitz and other formations across Western North America um, from this group. And what I discovered is that there are six different species of bayonet turtles, at least, uh, living in the river systems uh, that were uh, deposited and eventually became the uh, Kaparowitz Formation. Uh, a number of these are known from other uh, formations across the western interior, in particular um, the Fruitland and Kirtland Formations of New Mexico, uh, but a few of these were brand new. Uh, one of these uh, uh, new species that I got to name is called Neurinchylus hutchinsoni. Uh, Neurinchylus is a genus of turtle uh, that uh, are quite large. Uh, some, some of them, uh, most of them uh, could get up to uh, about two feet in length, at least the length of their shell. Uh, if you include uh, the tail and the head, would have been even longer. Uh, but uh, Neurinchylus hutchinsoni uh, is actually uh, a, probably one of the largest turtles in this freshwater ecosystem, or at least we thought. I'll talk about a large larger one here in a second. Um, but uh, this was uh, uh, this particular fossil at the University of California at Berkeley was discovered by Howard Hutchison uh, and uh, the name of this taxon uh, honors his contributions uh, to uh, turtle research both in the Kaparowitz Formation and beyond. Uh, this is a really neat uh, fossil because uh, it shows that uh, this turtle had 
a very highly domed shell, very similar to modern day tortoises. Um, and uh, we've actually found a few other examples of this since. There's at least one other uh, highly domed neuronchyla shell from the uh, uh, Kaparowitz formation, indicating that this isn't just a one-off. Uh, but what I think is the most interesting turtle that I worked on for my master's is this animal called Arvina Keeleys. Uh, now, Arvina Keeleys has a beautifully preserved uh, skull along with the rest of the skeleton. And uh, we CT scanned uh, this animal at the University of uh, Utah uh, at the uh, small animal CT scanner uh, up there. And was uh, we were able to digitally prepare away uh, all of the rock matrix inside of uh, this turtle's skull uh, to reveal a lot more about the anatomy. Now, what's really interesting and unique about our vena Achilles is the shape of its face. You'll notice it actually has two nostrils at the front of its face. This is very different than pretty much every other turtle in the evolutionary history of turtles, which only have one bony nostril in their skull, one external narial opening. So when you look at a turtle's face and you see two nostrils, that's really just a fleshy division between those nostrils. But our vena Achilles is unique because it has those uh, two bony nostrils, uh, which to me made it look uh, kind of like a pig's snout. And ultimately, that's what I named this turtle after, our vena Achilles. Uh, number one, it honors Jerry Golden. Uh, that's why it's Arvina Achilles Golden Eye. Uh, honors Jerry Golden, a, a volunteer preparator at the Natural History Museum of Utah. But it, uh, uh, the genus name uh, means bacon turtle. Uh, it's really looked like a pig snout to me, so I named it after bacon. Uh, so Jerry Golden's bacon turtle, I think, is one of the most interesting turtles to live in uh, Western North America during the Cretaceous, uh, the very end of the age of dinosaurs, and it's only known from uh, Southern Utah, from Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. So animals like this, we would not know about were it not for the monument. And ultimately, the Kaparowitz Formation is a great comparison to other places in Western North America, in particular, the Dinosaur Park Formation of Alberta uh, has been explored for fossils for over 100 years. And because turtle fossils are so common in these ecosystems, uh, in, in these deposits, uh, we have a really good handle on the turtle assemblage known from the Dinosaur Park Formation. And after 100 years, uh, we know of uh, around 12 species from the Dinosaur Park Formation. Uh, now, living at this same time, roughly between 76 and 74 million years ago, uh, in the Kaparowitz Formation, so far, we have 17 different species of turtles from that particular formation in uh, Grand Staircase. Now, this is really neat because other than some research going on um, in the 80s and 90s and a little bit uh, earlier than that, most of uh, the research efforts in the monument have uh, been going on for really just the past two decades, uh, in particular the past 25 years uh, since it was named a monument. And just in that small amount of time, we already know of more species of turtles than Dinosaur Park has in over 100 years of research. Uh, so when I say we know of 17 species from uh, the monument from the Kaparowitz Formation, it's probably a low estimate. Uh, that's a, a minimum number. We will likely uh, discover a new species in the coming years. And um, the reason that's uh, really interesting to me is because uh, there's an assumption because uh, the uh, Cretaceous is a much warmer environment, a uh, much warmer global climate that uh, animals are able to spread over broader geographic region regions. And you should have similar high diversity in Utah as you have in Alberta, as you do at the equator. But it turns out that you do have a reduction in turtle diversity as you go further north, just like you see today. 
Uh, in the modern environment, you see many more species of turtles in South Alabama than you do in Illinois, for example. And uh, that biotic pattern seemed to be the case as well, uh, even during uh, uh, these globally warm climates of the very end of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, one thing uh, that is brand new from the Kaparowitz formation is uh, this one particular turtle highlighted at the bottom of the screen, a panchelonioid. Now, I haven't talked about that one yet because it's brand new. Uh, what is a panchelonioid, though? Uh, these, uh, in uh, layman's terms, these are sea turtles. Uh, modern day sea turtles, you're likely very familiar with them, uh, but uh, sea turtles, uh, the group that includes modern day sea turtles, the panchelonioids, go back to the Cretaceous, uh, actually millions of years prior to uh, deposition of Kaparowitz formation. Um, and some of these include some of the largest turtles ever to have lived, uh, especially the protostegid turtles like Archelon. These were Volkswagen-sized sea turtles, just absolutely massive uh, turtles swimming around in the oceans at the time. Uh, and these are the main examples of your modern day sea turtles, things like your leatherbacks, your green turtles, uh, your Ridley turtles, flatbacks, hawksbills. Those are the main sea turtles that are around today. Now, we're talking about the Kaparowitz formation, which we talked about is a uh, system representing a system of rivers, lakes, and floodplains. This is not the ocean. Uh, so how do we get, why are we talking about sea turtles? Uh, well, um, just recently, in the past few years, uh, Dr. Alan Titus and colleagues have been excavating an amazing site in the Kaparowitz Formation of Grand Staircase Escalante. Uh, this is uh, known uh, to those of us in the field as the Rainbows and Unicorns Quarry and uh, was just recently published uh, earlier in 2021 uh, describing a potential gregarious behavior of uh, tyrannosaurs, uh, multiple tyrannosaurs, uh, Teratophonius were found in uh, this quarry from babies all the way up to adults. Uh, but other animals were actually uh, discovered in this quarry as well. It includes uh, the uh, massive crocodilian Dinosuchus, uh, some uh, duckbill dinosaurs, and then also plenty of turtles because it's the Kaparowitz formation and we find plenty of turtles. Now, one of those turtles, uh, Alan uh, Titus sent me a photograph of a few years ago and said, look at the size of this turtle. And yeah, I really couldn't wrap my head around how big this turtle lower jaw is. Uh, what you're looking at now is just the lower jaw of one of these turtles from the uh, Rainbows and Unicorns quarry. I couldn't really ID it. It didn't look quite right for a Bainid, didn't look right for a softshell turtle. And I thought those were really the only possibilities for a turtle of this size uh, from the Kaparowitz formation. Couldn't be a sea turtle, couldn't be a panchelonioid because the Kaparowitz formation is likely representing yeah, maybe uh, deposition 100 miles inland from the Western Interior Seaway at the time. Uh, but then Alan started sending me more photographs and uh, I uh, had the opportunity to travel down to Kanab and take a look at uh, uh, the fossils of this turtle. And sure enough, it it's a massive turtle, and it's not just uh, this one individual. Uh, so far, Alan has discovered two individuals. What, uh, what you're looking at here on the screen is that lower jaw, as well as a uh, humerus, the upper arm bone, uh, the upper flipper bone, it turns out, and, uh, and also the plastron, or the bottom of the shell of this turtle. And it turns out this uh, uh, the anatomy of this turtle doesn't it doesn't line up with any of those other groups of turtles that we've talked about so far. Uh, 
Allen also has this second individual of this same turtle uh, species uh, from uh, from the same quarry. So it's not just a one-off. We have uh, two individuals, and this second individual is actually much bigger, um, maybe a uh, you know a fifty percent larger than the first uh, uh, the first turtle that was discovered uh, from the uh, uh from the quarry and also when you look at the shell of this larger individual you can tell it's absolutely massive uh you can see uh, uh me holding up uh, one of the bones of the the shell of this uh turtle uh and you can see just how thick it is in fact uh, we're kind of questioning whether or not we've uh, uh mistaken chunks of ceratopsian frill in the past for pieces of this really large turtle's shell and uh, just recently, uh, uh, Dr. Titus has, uh, uh, and his team of volunteers, phenomenal group of uh, volunteers at the monument uh, there in Kanab, have been uh, preparing out more of uh, the larger individual, uh, including uh, bones from uh, the periphery, the peripheral bones of the shell, as well as another large humerus, upper arm bone, and even uh, uh, the thigh bone, the femur of the larger of the two individuals. So we're getting multiple bones of uh, both the small individual and larger individual. And uh, uh, here's another example of one of these uh, bones. This is Alan's volunteer, Nettie, who has been uh, uh, preparing a costal bone. Uh, these are the bones in the shell that fuse to the ribs. And Nettie's uh, costal here is 45 centimeters wide. Now, it's not at the widest part of the shell. The shell is already tapering by the sixth uh, costal, which is what I think this is. And if you double, 45 because uh, uh, you have a costal on each side of uh, the shell uh, and then add in uh, the peripheral bones and the neural bone in the center where the shell is starting to narrow down this thing is over a meter wide uh, so this is a turtle shell that's over three feet wide where it's beginning to narrow uh, that's probably going to equate to a turtle shell that is over six feet long that's a large freshwater turtle, uh, likely the largest freshwater turtle of the Cretaceous. And after spending some time uh, doing some preliminary work on both the larger and the smaller individual, it's very clear that this is, sure enough, a panchelonioid, a sea turtle living in a freshwater environment. And after spending a little bit of time on uh, my first day, on my first uh, 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 research trip to look at this animal in Kanab, I started you know, getting deja vu. I said, this turtle looks very familiar to something that I've seen. Sure enough, I started comparing it with some quick cell phone photos I had taken of an animal called Terlingua keeles in the collections at the University of Texas where I did my PhD. And here on the left side of the screen, you can see Alan's uh, sea turtle. On the right is the lower jaw, uh, the mandible of Terlingua keeles. Uh, very similar uh, when you start to compare uh, individual features of these uh, two turtles. The upper arm bone, the humerus, again, very similar when you get down to the nitty gritty of the anatomy uh, uh those features i'm not going to go into in this talk uh they actually compare very well so we think so far at least uh, based on our preliminary work that this uh, sea turtle is very similar to this animal called Terlingua keeles, uh, which was originally described in 2004. It's one of these protostagid sea turtles. It's one of these uh, uh, members of a group that gets very, very large. Um, and it's known from a similar aged formation, the Aguja formation, uh, just outside of Big Bend, uh, Texas. Uh, this one is a little bit different, though, because it is from a marginal marine setting. 
Uh, so it's from a formation that has rivers and floodplains, but it's from a very distal part of that formation, uh, right where it meets the Western Interior Seaway. Um, and since this animal has been described in 2004, it hasn't really been uh, included in a lot of other studies of uh, sea turtles. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the... Uh, the Aguja Formation from West Texas, and showing uh, the stratigraphic section, the geology of uh, the area where uh, Terlingua Achilles was collected. And uh, sure enough, if you uh, look at that, the geology of the area the, and the geology of the site, it's kind of sandwiched between oyster beds, beach deposits, and uh, deposits just offshore from uh, uh, the beach. Uh, indicating that, sure enough, this is a marine turtle. Uh, so, very different environment than uh, that preserving our freshwater sea turtle from Kaparowitz. Now, how do we know that, uh, other than just from the general history of uh, studying geology in the Kaparowitz formation, that this is for sure a freshwater sea turtle and not something that just got washed in upstream by a hurricane or something like that. Um, thanks to uh, uh, some of uh, Dr. Titus's colleagues, in particular, Diego Yamamura and Selena Suarez, who have looked at the oxygen isotopes of the shells of uh, different turtles from the rainbows and unicorns quarry, we can see that uh, based on the oxygen isotopes that this panchelonioid has a very similar isotopic signature to all the other turtles that are preserved in this quarry. Uh, in fact, based on uh, this isotopic signature, looking at the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, it has a low delta O18 value, especially compared to uh, the oxygen isotope value of protostagids of sea turtles from what we know were marine environments. Uh, so in this example, uh, in this study from 2011, uh, Coulson et al., they sampled uh, sea turtle shells from both Kansas as well as Alabama. And you can see that these values, 17 and 20 respectively, are much higher than uh, uh, the value of 12 delta uh, 018 uh, that you see in our Kaparowitz uh, panchelonioid. So what you get, you get higher values uh, uh, in marine environments versus terrestrial environments. And then once you get into uh, salt water, uh, the Delta 018 begins tracking temperature in set instead, which makes sense uh, because you have higher values in Alabama than you do in Kansas. Uh, so the big key takeaway uh, based not just on the geology of the site, but also the oxygen isotopes, is that the Kaparowitz protostagid was living in fresh water. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing some more research in coming years to figure out was it living in a freshwater environment its entire life. Uh, we'll hopefully figure that out pretty soon. Uh, but on top of all of this great diversity of turtles that we have from the Kaparowitz formation, uh, in, in addition to that is that we have this sea turtle living maybe 50 to 100 miles inland and potentially spending its entire life in a freshwater environment. Uh, so I, I want to thank many folks that have uh, helped me out along the way in my studies of uh, uh, turtles from Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, including uh, in particular the folks at the University of Utah, where I've done my master's um, uh, back before I uh, went on to my PhD at Texas, uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, in particular Alan Titus and his uh, crews of volunteers and employees, and 
And uh, yeah, I really just want to highlight that uh, um, I would not be the paleontologist I am today without these folks and the opportunity to spend the last 11 years working in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. So I'm very honored to be a part of uh, this 25th anniversary celebration. And uh, of course, thanks to all of the funding agencies uh, that have funded my research over the years. And thank you uh, for attending this uh, 25th anniversary celebration of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument.